Solitaire Townsend has been for a long time uh, talking about and, and, and working with companies and governments and others around sustainability, communications, uh, strategy. If you look on the homepage of Green Biz, don't do it right now, but uh, you will see a story this morning by Solitaire Townsend called Why You Should Not Sell Sustainability. So it's that lovely kind of uh, counterintuitive, uh, provocative thinking that I'm really happy to bring to the stage. Please join me in welcoming the co-founder of Futera, Solitaire Townsend. Soli? Thank you, thank you. Good morning, Phoenix. Come on, I traveled a long way and it's really warm and sunny here. I'm really happy. Good morning, Phoenix. Now that's what I'm talking about. Um, as someone who uh, is here to talk to you about communicating sustainability, by the way, communicating sustainability always better in a British accent, well one. <laughs> just, just in general, although few things aren't. Uh, rule number two of communicating sustainability is let's enjoy it. Let's, let's have some energy. Let's remember that we are working on the most exciting, the most disruptive, the most important issues of the 21st century. Uh, and for the vast majority of the people who are not in this room, for our fellow human beings, our fellow staff members, our customers, our consumers, citizens of the countries around the world that we serve, Sustainability is essentially an invisible idea. It's an invisible idea. Because the, the, the technical language, the terminology parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the three letter, letter acronyms are a massive barrier to entry to this passionate, important, world-changing idea. However, you can get cut through. And this is what sustainability looks like at its best for our friends and our colleagues out there. Take a good look, especially at that orange. That's, that's one seriously ugly orange. This is a campaign that Intermarché, the third largest supermarket chain in France, ran in 2013. You might recognize it because it's often used as an example of breakthrough engagement with consumers. In 2013, Intermarché started selling ugly fruit and vegetables at 30% off. Ugly fruit and vegetables at 30% off. They sold out in the first 24 hours, and they had to go searching for more ugly fruit and vegetables. <laughs> an uh, ugly apple, an ugly potato, an ugly, uh, an, an ugly carrot. Although bluntly, sustainability communications does sound great in, in British. It sounds even better in French. Development durable. I mean, come on. I, even I can sell that. This, this campaign is a perfect example for me of the anti-intuitive way that sustainability communications can work. Most supermarkets uh, dismiss either in the supply chain or in store fruit and vegetables that do not conform to the norm. They don't conform to the norm. They are not perfectly straight, they're not perfectly round. Intermarché challenged that and they worked through this extraordinary idea of selling at money off, so a functional benefit to the consumers, of selling something with an emotion. They asked us to feel bad, to feel good, to feel like I wanted to give that ugly apple a second chance. Although, honestly, I might have juiced it rather than eating it. The Intermarché campaign, this communications campaign that engaged France, has now led, not directly, but with some significant influence, to in December of, this, of last year, in December of last year, the Senate in France voting that supermarkets are no longer allowed to waste food. Any supermarket food in France that goes unused or unsold or that doesn't meet the criteria when it hits the store must now be donated to charities or must be, must be sent uh, to feed others. This is the power of really good, really powerful, really simple and emotional engagement around sustainability. We often think, be it from smoking to seatbelts, that regulation is what drives behavior change. Sometimes behavior change can drive regulation. Sometimes it can't. 2010, the pink bucket, the KFC bucket for the cure. 
uh, where KFC, if you bought a great big bucket full of fried chicken, donated 50 cents to breast cancer charities, 50 cents. Uh, didn't go particularly great for them. Uh, greed cancer, the pink KFC buckets. What the cluck? <laughs> is buying KFC by the bucket a good way to fight, fight breast cancer? This is, this is the problem with our sustainability communications. This is the problem with how we have either got Intermarché on one side or KFC on the other. A lack of empathy, a lack of intelligence, a lack of desire for change. KFC was not attempting to change the salt or sugar levels in their products. They were simply trying to gain that halo effect. And I've lost members of my family to breast cancer. I'm a big fan of raising money for breast cancer, but not through product lines that actively control contribute to that terrible disease. Later on today, I'm going to be running a workshop where we're going to be revealing some new research that uh, with Futera, in partnership with BSR, has done with Stanford University and the brands on here, looking at how to communicate sustainability, looking at uh, the behavior change criteria of sustainability, and crucially, working with Stanford to measure what messages get breakthrough and what measures don't. A-B testing in the marketplace. McDonald's is actually going to be revealing the first research results from this testing. I'm just gonna, and the crucial, crucial outcome that we learnt through two years of working with these brands, Futera, my agency, with BSR, was that everybody's different when it comes to these communications. Everybody responds in a different way to messages around social and environmental change. And we respond in one of three ways. Now, this is not my work. This comes from an amazing American from Michigan called Pat Dade. And Pat Dade developed what he called the values modes typology for how all of us respond to sustainability. Now, this is not a demographic. Although, by the way, when I explain it, it's going to sound like a demographic in America. It's not. It's a psychographic. It's based on our deep psychological values and how we see our, our place in the world. And in this room, there is going to be each one of these categories. I'll start with the green pioneers. The green pioneers, those of you who are green pioneers, live in a big world. The world that you live in is so large, you're concerned about sea level rise in Bangladesh, you're concerned about SARS in China, you're concerned about women's rights in South America. You live in a very big world. For you, the idea that a community could be geographic is strange. Why would I have anything in common with my neighbors? I have more in common with people around the world who think and feel the same way I do. For the green pioneers, the word change is a good word. Change automatically means that things are going to get better. And for the green pioneers, they want activism, they want to change the world. They have such a high sense of urgency, uh, of agency, such a high sense of ability to make a difference, they actually think that if they don't fly, it might directly affect climate change. So green pioneers, change, big world, no real connection to geography. The exact opposite of the green pioneers are your brick settlers. Your brick settlers live in a small world. Their world is their workplace, it's where their, their neighbors, it's where their kid goes to school. The idea of the entire world is almost mythological to the brick settlers. It's one of the reasons why they deny climate change, not because they necessarily deny the science, but because anything on a global scale almost feels like it's not real, because reality is my neighbors. Community is geographic for the brick settlers, and they probably know that the little old lady who lives next door has been having difficulties getting out and about and doing her shopping. Your green pioneer isn't going to know that, because your green pioneer is going to be involved in activism, petitions, but maybe not in local community issues. Change is a bad word for the, green for, for the brick settlers. Change means things are going to get worse. So when it comes to environmental issues, for example, a brick settler might want a solar power, a so solar panel. But a brick settler would want a solar panel because they want to be energy independent. They want to, get, they want to opt out of the big guys setting what their energy bills are. Whereas a green pioneer wants a solar panel because they want to change the world, because they want to uh, 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 confront climate change. Then you've got your gold prospectors. Your gold prospectors do not live in a big world or a small world. They live in a world of the self. Their scale is personal. They do not get their sense of self from inside. They get their sense of self from what other people think of them, from what other people think of them, which means if it is 
high status, if it's sexy to care about social and environmental issues, they'll care. If it's not, they won't. And the green perspective, the, 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 the gold perspectives care about success, esteem, fun, visibility. They're very much in the moment. They want a solar panel because it will be seen on the street view cam from Google and all their friends and neighbors will see. But by the way, if, if they have to put the solar panels on the back of the house where no one sees them, they're not gonna be that interested. The gold perspectives, these three are not, I show them as equal size for the sake of the slide. These three are not equal in size. The gold perspectives are by far the largest demographic in the US or anywhere else. They spend all the money, they are all of your consumer base. These are some of the ways that you can engage them, from saving and safety for the brick settlers, to activism and novelty for the green pioneers, sentiment, status, and benefit for the gold perspectives. Can we bring the house lights up just for one second, please? My final point, I would like to out the room. Who here would say they are a green pioneer? Big world, love change. Great. You are overrepresented in this room. <laughs> Who here would say that they are a brick settler? Who here is a brick settler? Well done, brick settlers. You usually don't like to raise your hands. I'm really proud of you guys. Who here would say they are a, uh, they're a gold prospector? Anyone who paid more than $40 for their shoes, put your hands up. Thank you very much. Yeah, well done. So in this room, we are overrepresented in the green pioneers. And that means that we need to either change the entire rest of the world to become like us, which might not work, or we need to change the way that we think about engaging people. We need to engage the gold prospectors where they are, and we need to engage the brick settlers where they are. And if that's the one thing that I would ask you to remember from what I just said, is you guys are weird, and if you want to change the world, we need to go mainstream. Thank you very much. So ask how we can give our consumer more, whoever they are. I hope to see you at our workshop later today. Brilliant. Thank you. Nicely done, sir.